Welcome to another episode of Myeloma Crowd TV. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom, a myeloma patient like you. Today's show is on early precursor conditions of multiple myeloma, specifically smoldering myeloma. Myeloma experts tell us that every myeloma patient had an early form of myeloma. The first condition is called MGUS, or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. Another early condition that likely follows MGUS is called smoldering myeloma. This is when some of the features of multiple myeloma are in place, but perhaps not progressing to active disease. Because both of these conditions do not always progress to active myeloma, doctors historically have taken a watch and wait approach. But with new therapies in the clinic that are less toxic, myeloma experts are now questioning that approach, especially when they see certain groups of patients who will progress. They and we wonder if myeloma can pre be prevented if treated early. Dr. Irene Gobriel at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute has created an entire initiative around this idea. So the Center for Prevention of Progression is a new initiative that we started at Dana-Farber about a year and a half ago. Um, and the whole idea came from a very simple thing. In solid cancers, in breast cancer or in colon cancer, we're doing screening all the time for our patients. So when I'm age 40, I go for my mammogram or colonoscopy when we're a little bit older. And if you see a small little polyp or if you see something in your um, mammogram, usually we have things removed immediately and we don't say, well, why don't you wait until you have lesions in your bone or you have metastasis of breast cancer and then I'll treat you. Yet for blood cancer, we see every single day a patient with MGUS or a patient which is monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance or a patient with an early MDS. And we tell them, oh, wait until you have myeloma, wait until you have leukemia, and then I'll treat you. And that whole idea of watch and wait is something that we've inherited. We've all been taught this way. And it made sense probably in the older days when we had no treatment, we had no effective therapy, and the treatment was actually very harmful. So if you're asymptomatic and you're doing well, it makes sense not to treat you. But these days, with us understanding all the mechanisms of clonal evolution, of the tumor cells are not sitting as, you know, things that are not acquiring new mutations as we leave them alone. And as we understand better the immune microenvironment, that as the tumor cells grow more and more, they're able to make your immune system worse and worse. And as we understand all of this, it doesn't make sense for us anymore to say, well, why don't we just watch and wait until you have a full-blown disease, until you have metastatic myeloma, and then I'll treat you. And that whole concept is, is something that we need to change in our mind as physicians. We need to change for our patients, but start to prove it also clinically. We cannot say, yes, it doesn't make sense. We have to actually truly prove that early treatment makes a difference in the survival of patients with myeloma. And if we prove that, then suddenly we're changing everything. We're changing the way we think of our asymptomatic patients walking around. But you can also think that 3% of the population over the age of 50 has MGUS, and that's a huge number of people that we're not screening for, we're not looking for them. And if we know that we can make a difference in their life, we should be starting to look for them and screen them. And instead of just doing a mammogram or a colonoscopy or even checking your cholesterol level and making sure you don't get a heart attack and you die from it, we want to make sure you don't have MGUS and you will develop myeloma in 20 years from now and I can prevent myeloma. The monoclonal protein spikes that can be seen in myeloma were seen as early as the 1950s by Dr. Waldenstrom in Sweden. We were fortunate enough to have Dr. Robert Kyle of the Mayo Clinic attend one of our myeloma crowd round tables. He knew the history of MGUS and smoldering myeloma because he was the true pioneer in the space. In the 50s, he learned of the work by Dr. Waldenstrom and started noticing that his patients had this early condition. He also noticed that some of them progressed to active myeloma. And so our patient had a essential hypergamma globulinemia, anemia, but it was not benign. It developed into multiple myeloma. And so we published that as a lowly case report and made the point that it is not safe to assume that these patients have a benign condition even after years of observation. Dr. Kyle created the terms MGUS and smoldering myeloma after studying 241 Mayo Clinic patients from 1956 to 1970 who had an M spike in the blood but no evidence of active multiple myeloma. He followed these patients over this extended period of time to learn more. And of these 241 patients, 64 of them progressed 
to a more serious disease. Forty-four of those, or two-thirds of those who progressed, developed multiple myeloma. Overall, these patients, the median period of time from the recognition of the monoclonal protein until the diagnosis of a serious progressive disease, was 10.4 years. According to Dr. Kyle, MGRS progresses at the rate of 1% per year to either myeloma, amyloidosis, or Waldenstrom's without a significant change. This data is based on his 40-year follow-up. Smoldering myeloma progresses at a rate of 10% per year for the first five years and then decreases to a rate similar to MGUS. So the longer your disease remains in the smoldering stage, the better your chances of not developing multiple myeloma. Smoldering myeloma is defined as having a monoclonal protein, or M-spike, of over 3 grams per deciliter and or 10 to 60 percent of clonal bone marrow plasma cells. It's also defined by the absence of end organ damage, so no renal failure, anemia, or bone lesions. Smoldering myeloma can be low risk or high risk. In slides from Dr. Vincent Rajkumar's recent discussion at the American Society of Hematology meeting in San Diego, he outlines how smoldering myeloma patients are segmented and defined for treatment. Other conditions can be present that classify patients as high-risk smoldering myeloma, or patients who are likely to progress within a two-year period. These include an increase in the M-spike, circulating plasma cells in the blood, or high-risk genetic features like gene deletions or translocations that are known to create aggressive disease in myeloma patients. If patients have just one or two of these features in blue, they can be treated for high-risk smoldering myeloma inside of a clinical trial. If they have all of these features, they can be treated in the clinic outside of a study. So to treat or not to treat, that's a challenging question for doctors and patients, but experts are coming to a greater consensus. Keep watching and waiting for low or standard risk smolders, but treat for high risk before end organ damage occurs. Uh, patients with uh, smoldering multiple myeloma should uh, be treated only if they have high risk. These patients are destined to progress at a higher rate and so consequently a prospective randomized study would be more feasible in this group of individuals. We think that if you have high risk smoldering disease, the chances of progression are really high. I think that probably in the next couple of years it will become standard of care that we treat patients. It, it's, it's becoming too obvious for us. Um, we don't need, you know, 500 randomized trials. It's becoming so clear that those patients do progress very fast and we should do something now about it. Doctors are starting to talk about a cure for myeloma. Is there a potential to cure the disease by preventing it from progressing? Dr. Nupur Rajay of the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston thinks so. So if you want to be thinking about curative strategies in patients with myeloma, you know, it's important to start early and that's why this whole smoldering space is an area where a lot of research is being done. One study for smoldering myeloma is a clinical trial focusing on the use of immunotherapies to prevent myeloma from ever taking hold in the first place. Dr. Rajay explains this study using a vaccine from Oncopep. So specifically what we are doing in the trial that I'm running at MGH and it's uh, being conducted at several other sites in the country is using an immune approach uh, that is a vaccination strategy and it's almost like, uh, you know, any other vaccination strategy where you give a vaccine to a patient with the idea that you then educate that patient's immune system to react against whatever it is that you have uh, vaccinated against. In this case, what we are using is a vaccine against their myeloma cells. So the PBX410 vaccine is a tripeptide vaccine. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of peptide vaccines in the past, but most of them have been directed against one particular protein alone. So what's unique about this is the fact that it is recognizing three different proteins. It recognizes CD. 138, it recognizes, uh, which is present pretty much in all myeloma cells, and that's how we identify myeloma cells. 
uh, it recognizes SLAM F7 or CS1, which is the same protein which is recognized by elotuzumab. And the third protein it recognizes is XBP1, and it recognizes two forms of that XBP1, a spliced form and the whole form as well. And the idea of uh, incorporating all of these proteins as one vaccine is so that you don't miss out on recognizing tumor cells because tumor uh, cells in patients can be fairly heterogeneous and you know you might have some tumor cells which express high levels of one protein versus not and the fact that we've been able to incorporate all of these four proteins into one vaccine allows us uh, the ability to try and recognize the majority of tumor cells in a myeloma patient. That's essentially the goal and what we would like to see with the trial is be able to see whether we are able to achieve that um, uh, objective. And the good news is over the last few years we as a myeloma community have been able to identify who are the ones who are at a higher risk of progression and this is based on their monoclonal protein level looking at the serum free light chain level looking at bone marrow plasma cytosis so all of these features help guide us and help us decide your risk of progression and in those folks who have a moderate to a higher risk of progression would be the ones we would focus on for this trial. So what we have in the trial is, um, it's uh, not a very big trial, it's about 26 patients that we think we're going to be uh, putting on the study and we're doing it in three, uh, three different arms. One arm is where we're actually not using the vaccine at all, but we're using this pdl one blocking antibody duvalumab and we know that pdl one specifically is actually quite highly expressed on myeloma cells. So what we wanted to see as an initial phase was what is the uh, antibody on its own do. The second part of the study is where we will vaccinate patients and along with that vaccination we'll use this monoclonal antibody against uh, PDL1 called Duvalumab and the idea there is the vaccine is going to boost up your immune system and this checkpoint blocker against PDL1 will uh, inhibit some of the negative effects that tumor has on the immune system and allow the immune system to have a more robust response. And the third arm is going to be, we've already shown data with the vaccine and the immunomodulatory drug Revlimid, and we've shown that with that combination we are actually seeing memory T cells in patients, which is pretty amazing actually and what we are trying to do here is add on that checkpoint blocker and see whether or not we can do even better than what we've seen so far. A second study for smoldering myeloma patients is open to see if treatment with the common myeloma drug lenalidomide makes a difference for patients. Lenalidomide is known to both kill myeloma and boost the immune system at the same time. Dr. Sager Loniel at the Winship Cancer Institute shares his open clinical trial. So the ECOG smoldering myeloma trial is a phase three randomized trial that's trying to really get additional data in addition to what we know from the Spanish myeloma trial. And if you may recall, the Spanish trial was Revlimid and Dex versus observation for a group of patients they defined as high risk smoldering. Uh, that trial did show a benefit for early therapy but some of the events there that occurred occurred very early, making us wonder whether some of those patients actually had myeloma as opposed to smoldering. So in the ECOG trial, which is the one I'm leading, it's a randomized trial of lenalidomide or Revlimid alone versus observation. And what we're trying to prove is that treatment at all makes a difference in these patients. And we're enrolling over 200 patients in total for the entire trial between the control arm and the treatment arm, trying to understand side effects, trying to understand quality of life, and trying to understand whether it's not just remission, but survival for these patients, whether you make a difference. I will tell you, I've been surprised by patients in both arms. Uh, patients in the Revlimid arm, some have done remarkably well, and patients in the control arm that I thought, oh, I wish they'd have gotten Revlimid, have done far better than I would have expected. And I think the lesson there is we can't always predict how people are going to do. We think we know, but we don't. And that's why the control arm is so important in this trial. We asked Dr. Loniel if there was a difference in patients with specific genetic features. 
So we're doing gene expression profiling on everybody at baseline, um, and we've not none of that data has been looked at yet because we don't want to bias the analysis one way or the other. Um, but it's it's interesting because uh, there are again a number of patients in both arms that have done better than I would have predicted. Um, again, sort of sort of highlighting the importance of these kinds of trials and telling us who should be observed, who should be treated with smoldering myeloma. Now another immunotherapy clinical trial is testing elotuzumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone for smoldering myeloma patients. A fourth study is open at the National Cancer Institute using lenalidomide, dexamethasone, and carfilzomib. This is a combination that's also being used to treat active myeloma. A similar study using two drugs is open at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. It will use the oral proteasome inhibitor, exazomib or Nilaro, and dexamethasone. These two drugs are commonly used in myeloma therapy. The convenient part about this study is that it's an all-oral combination. So how will myeloma specialists find out who will progress and who will not? Dr. Gobril has an observational study open that all MGUS or smoldering myeloma patients can participate in. When you sign up, you will be mailed containers for blood and marrow samples. When you have your regular testing done at your local center, you can ask for extra samples to be taken. Then you can simply mail them to Dana-Farber. Her study, called PCROWD, will help identify who will progress and who will not so progression can be prevented. You can click the link below to learn more about this study and it's so easy to join. PCROWD came with the idea that it's a precursor crowdsourcing, but instead of crowdsourcing for funding, we're crowdsourcing for patients to give their information and to be part of this, that initiative. And it came again from the idea that patients are truly the best empowerment for moving research forward. They can truly drive the idea of collecting samples, giving information, but also can drive the research. They can really make a difference in this. Finally, smoldering myeloma patients need to know that help is available. It can be a real head game to live with something that may or may not progress into an incurable blood cancer. So here are four things you can do to get your best outcomes. Number one, there's a Facebook group for both MGUS patients run by Vicki Marcus House and a Smoldering Myeloma Facebook group run by Dana Holmes that you can join. These are great resources to learn about the latest in treatments, clinical trials, and can provide emotional support for the challenge. You can find links to these groups on the homepage sidebar of the Myeloma Crowd website. Second, find a top tier myeloma specialist to help assess and treat your disease. For example, imaging technologies like MRIs or PET CT scans and bone marrow biopsies are critical to help patients get a proper diagnosis. Number three, ask your specialist which risk category you're in and why, and why that will determine your course of treatment. Number four, stay up to date on potential early treatment strategies, including clinical trials for high-risk smoldering myeloma like the ones we mentioned in this show, and for newly diagnosed patients, just in case you need immediate treatment. You can never be underprepared. I think in the next two years, it would be interesting how we change completely the way we think of high-risk smoldering and maybe even earlier and earlier in the disease progression of myeloma. We look forward to seeing continued progress and a day where myeloma can be prevented from ever happening in the first place. Thanks for watching.